course, the idea of actually plugging in your pieces that make up the computer was original with us. See, everybody today builds them with cards that are plugged in. Well, just the idea of building it, the first machine was built with several hundreds of pieces that are built little chassis that plugged in. So if you had trouble, you could pull the whole section out and jam one in. That was the new idea there with this project. The base of the basic principles came out in the first year or something we worked on it. And some of them, according to what other people tell me, were, were in the ideas that Babbage had much earlier for mechanical things, but he wasn't able to get the stuff to work. The machines have practically always been capable of doing things that people weren't quite ready to do or didn't quite ready to know how to program decently. It's the software. This industry has been spending more on software development than hardware development now for over 30 years. Software is the name of the game. By 1962, I'd written a description of what I wanted to do, and I began to get the money the next year. And by 1968, we were on our third computer. <laughs> it was a er very early time-sharing computer. So in a computer conference in San Francisco, I volunteered to run a whole session where we would do a real live video projection on a screen uh, from showing what we could do. So it was a very first world seeing a mouse, seeing outline processing, seeing hypertext, seeing mixed text and graphics, etc. And seeing this kind of real-time video conferencing work. And it, so it was quite a notable thing. The thing about it is we thought the world would begin right away to turn towards those. And uh, then it was another 14 years before the mouse even emerged, much less the structured hypertext and all of that and the groupware thing we were doing. One of the problems that existed at that time was the so-called information explosion. There had been so much publishing post-war that it was nearly impossible to determine if a particular topic had ever been addressed in publication. And it was said at Lockheed, for instance, it was usually cheaper to redo the research than it was to uh, find if anyone had done the research previously. So. We undertook to develop an interactive information retrieval language, which is called Dialog. Uh, the idea was, if you have a curiosity or an interest, we want to provide a system that will satisfy that curiosity or that interest or that information problem. I worked on developing one of the first video displays for personal computers. Uh, I worked on a, the first personal computer that looked like a personal computer with a keyboard, rather like a typewriter with no place to put the paper, as it's been described. And I designed the Osborne One, the first portable computer. This is somewhat like somebody who's starving to death, but he's got a, a kitchen cabinet full of canned goods, loaded with great food, no can opener. In many cases, what the computer was is just a can opener to open all the stuff that's been sitting around for a long while waiting to be opened and worked on. What we call a computer today will be a network of communicating, let's say, subcomputers. So there will be some other words for them. Um, a lot of them will be portable. They'll be carried in the pocket. They'll be on hand when you need them. The marketplace for the products and the, both the consumer and the producer in the computer, at least the interactive computer marketplace, has been mostly focused on individuals in the past. And that, it'll be a very different marketplace when it's an organization that's saying, I need to buy products, and beginning with the networking and the client server relationships and all of that and the standards involved, so that in the end, everybody in my organization looks through whatever terminal he buys into a, an organizational knowledge workshop that has coherence and consistency, and that where the vocabulary that those users have about what are the substances they're working on, the objects, and what can they do to them, those vocabularies have to be consistent throughout your organization, no matter whose products you're buying. I would not be surprised to see within the next two to five years uh, access to vast stores of the actual images of the magazines, journals, newspapers, patents, and so forth, as opposed to merely having access to the text of those documents, as is the case today. So that in planning an internal network, one would want to plan for the resolution necessary to uh, benefit from actual image 
transmission and retrieval and display. One of the real hazards is that if people keep depending upon new technology coming in that's satisfying the perceived needs of today or tomorrow, that this does inch you up in improving and sort of like you're climbing a hill of improvement. But the thing about this new frontier is there are lots of hills and there's some of them going to be much bigger and you actually might keep on improving till you come to the top of the hill you're working on and you look around and says, oh my God, there's another hill over there we should have been on going up. You don't, you don't find these different hills by doing that incremental hill climbing. It takes, you, you got to explore. That doesn't mean you want to jump into every new idea that comes along without looking into it carefully. And I don't mean to imply I'm probably more careful than anybody is about really examining an idea on paper and analyzing it mathematically and crossing things out, particularly crossing things out before I go into something. I used to call this a dollar discipline, you see, in, in designing anything. We wouldn't put any new thing in it, improve our design, unless we could show on paper that it really would pay by a, by a big enough ratio that if you made a mistake, you'd still pay. Uh, but that also, I, I guess my philosophy of, of engineering can be some, and, and science and things, is, is, can be summarized by say, I, I believe in doing radical new things, but carrying them out in a very conservative way. With computer-based information re retrieval, we have a tool to satisfy curiosity. And the satisfaction of curiosity in turn stimulates even greater curiosity, which we then can satisfy. So now we're talking about person-motivated, individual-motivated learning. Learning by virtue of the curiosity that the individual has, as opposed to superimposed education from the outside. And this tool allows it to happen. Get your thinking off the straight line, off the point A to point B. Step back, take a look, a, a bigger look, a wider look. Try to figure out what might work for you, not just what somebody else did. It's possible to experiment, structure some experiments. You don't have to stake the whole company on them, but if you win, you win big. This is where the competitive edge can be obtained, and it can be a significant edge. It's how your company will be able to work smarter, and over the long haul, uh, you're the crucial people in this process. I can't emphasize that too much. And I wish I could give you the handbook on exactly how to do it, but it isn't written yet. <laughs>